Okay, I know Allison is a stickler for starting on time, so I'm going to start right on time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan McKenzie, Manager of PD and Member Engagement for Caucus. Uh, I'm calling today from Charlottetown, PEI. And if you're calling from somewhere where it's still morning, good morning. Uh, before we begin, we want to acknowledge that we have folks today joining us from across Canada and the United States. Uh, we're all viewing and participating in this webinar on traditional territories of Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, and we want to recognize the contributions to this place and express our gratitude for our ability to come together and learn together today. I want to extend a warm welcome to Lisa, who's with us today to caption this webinar. ACS generously supports Caucus by providing captioning services for our webinars, and we're very grateful for their support. Just a couple of housekeeping items. If you've called in on the phone, please mute yourself. Uh, if you're using the built-in audio in the room, you're muted automatically, but if you're on the phone, you need to mute from your end. Uh, we're hoping to hear from you today, and we have a little bit of a full house, which we're really excited about. Um, so we appreciate it if you'd use the chat box to communicate with our panel of presenters. We're going to be monitoring the chat. We'll attempt to get to all of your questions today. And if you'd like to unmute and ask a question using your voice, that's absolutely a possibility. Just let us know in the chat box, and we'll invite you to unmute your line. Um, and this will help us keeping the conversation running smoothly. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew and James to get things started. So thanks for leading us today and take it away. And we never worked out who was going to start, so James is going to jump in. Uh, before I move on to our introductory slides, I also want to pass on if anybody has any technical issues or concerns or follow-up, you can reach um, Allison at events at caucus.ca. Um, and so she's a great reference point if we need to go a little slower with email. She's, I think, monitoring those even as we speak. Um, I also want to invite everybody to get involved on the conference website as um, actually both through uh, our current um, oh, thank you, Alison, uh, Megan, um, through our current um, sort of webinar format, but also on the conference website itself. You'll find a lot of follow-up to what we're talking about today, and a lot of the resources that re we refer to will be available there. Without further ado, oh, look at that, we're way ahead. Um, I'd like to uh, mention myself. I'm James. As I said, I'm a counselor at UPI out of Charlottetown, just like Megan, although we are across town from each other. Um, and you can email me at jaredden at upi.ca if you'd like to follow up with me. Like, find me on Twitter at James Redden. I'm always, you know, you just don't have to look for anything else. Um, over to you, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Andrew Arita calling in from University of British Columbia on the Vancouver campus. I'm an associate registrar here and director of student recruitment and advising and undergraduate admissions. And I'm also here as the past president of the Association of Registrars of the Universities and Colleges of Canada. Uh, Arook is extremely happy to be partnering up with Caucus to uh, present this conference, a joint conference. Um, it's a, an exciting new development, and we're very happy to uh, be here partnering up to try to provide more content on more topics to more people uh, in a single conference. And my email address is up there if you want to follow up with anything uh, after the uh, after the presentation. And we're going to be joined today by a few special guests. Um, we'll introduce them as they come up, but uh, we're pleased to welcome Jean Thompson, John Chagall, Allison Girardin, and Megan McKenzie as part of our crew presenting to you today. Uh, I Yes, I'll keep going. So uh, we're hoping to get through our formal presentation in about 30 minutes. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about the presentations themselves and the value of presenting. We hope we so appreciate your time, not only in presenting at the conference, but spending uh, some time today with us learning about this. Uh, we hope that uh, you find that you get some value out of it as well. We hope that we'll be able to help you prepare so you can be confident in your pr presentation and have a great experience with it. Um, but with the, the quick presentation time, we also hope to have lots of time for Q&A, so please don't hesitate. If there's something you'd like to clar us to clarify on or follow up on, don't hesitate to use that chat box to let us know about it. Uh, we've got Megan uh, watching that closely, so I'm pretty confident we won't miss any questions. So we're going to cover a lot of ground during the presentation um, and uh, leave lots of time for questions as we go. In, in terms of the goals of what we want to, to do today, 
Um, really what we want to do is we want to make sure that, that anybody who has signed up to present uh, at the conference feels well supported, has the content that they need to put together their presentations. Um, we want to be, uh, to try and give you some tips, try and give you some advice, uh, but mostly we just want to be here for you to answer your questions and make sure that you get what you need in order to prepare a great presentation. Uh, what we've, we've put together some thoughts that we think might be helpful, but at the end of the day, this is really your presentation as the audience, so feel free to ask questions uh, and get the information you need to help set yourself up for success at the conference this year. And to gauge um, just uh, uh, where we are at in terms of the audience here, uh, we've got a poll that we put in place just to get a sense of how many of you have presented in the past. I think I'm going to pass it over to Allison, I think, to, uh, to run the poll for everybody. Poll running, and it's actually Megan, the original Megan McKenzie, running that poll right now. So I have to give her full credit. Have you presented at a Rook or Caucus before? Drum roll. Ooh. Ooh, the numbers changing right in front of our eyes. Ooh, a slight majority here for not having presented before. Welcome, everybody. We hope that you gain a lot of uh, information, helpful tips, uh, and some, some good foundation for preparing your presentation this year. And I'm going to take over again, Allison? Yep. yep. All right. Um, so great, yeah, we've got a nice split there. We definitely have some, some veterans on scene who will be able to share their expertise. Uh, we've got some new folks. I know that's always an exciting time. Um, sometimes exciting is code for exciting, and sometimes exciting is code for I'm afraid. Um, both of those are totally valid. Um, I want to start again, and I said it once already. I'm probably going to repeat it. It needs to be said loud and often. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, it is your time and your courage and your willingness to share your ideas and your passions that make the conference possible. And so that is so important. Um, but I hope you get something from it too. And I want you to, I want presenters to keep that in mind as they go into this, as they look forward, instead of thinking about it as a chore, a responsibility, or as intimidating. Um, it's also an opportunity for uh, continued growth. Um, it's a chance for you to contribute to the growth improvement of our field, um, both your field if you're a, a, a very specific professional, and the broader field of student affairs and student services. Um, this is your chance to test ideas and processes with a wider audience. Um, we often talk about the, uh, the dangers of living in a silo in uh, student affairs, and all of a sudden we're doing one thing and faculty are doing another and we wish we could get together. Well, this is one of our chances to get together, not only within our own institution, but even in the broader national scope. And this year, I believe, we've even got an extra chance to reach out across the aisle if you will, with this collaboration we have between a Rook and Caucus. Um, so I, I'm really excited about that, um, and I want you to be as well. Um, it's also a chance to you know, increase your own personal networking. I find my experience, both as a conference goer and as a presenter, has been that presenters get a more immersive experience in the conference experience. You, get, you see people, you get known, you have a far better chance to network. You also get to do some networking at the institutional level, representing, increasing institutional pride for the great work you're doing. Um, and I think that those are important to keep in mind. Like I said, when we do things with love, when we do things with passion, I think it shows in the present presentation. And if you can approach this preparation for presentation with an eye to enjoying it and valuing it, it's going to show up for everybody, and, and that's really important. Um, so once more, like I said, important things are worth repeating. There's, I suppose, what I might call hit number one in terms of your presentation. Thank you so much for presenting, for sharing your time, your passion, your insight and your anxiety. Um, it's a normal part of the process. Um, and to talk a little bit more about where we're going and our theme, I'd like to introduce uh, Jean Thompson, who's going to talk about the theme and how it relates to the conference. Hi, folks. Sorry, trying to just get off mute there. 
My name is Jean Thompson. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and you can reach me on Twitter if I'm there at Jeannie Thompson, or send me an email. I'm at the University of Guelph as the Walmus Educator here, and so you can find my email, T-H-O-M-P-S-J-A at uoguelph.ca. Um, so this year's conference theme is Sea Change, which is derived from sea or it comes from the idea of sea glass, which are the sparkling jewels we can find around the shores of PEI. And when considering the student experience, there are quite a few parallels to be drawn to the process uh, sea glass undergoes when it becomes uh, the pretty jewels that we see along the beaches. So a bottle or a piece of pottery finds its way into a new environment and it begins tossing and swirling around in all sorts of directions. It bumps up against obstacles and all the while it's being reshaped and refined to become, of course, more resilient. And finally, it's delivered onto our shorelines of our beaches a much stronger, unique, and a one-of-a-kind gem. And so this theme this year, we are going to see quite a bit in our plenaries. It, it's not a requirement for any of our concurrent sessions this year to incorporate the theme into them. However, um, throughout the course of the general conference, you're going to see uh, you're going to see that theme come up. So every morning of the conference this year is going to start off with a plenary with folks gathering all together to weave the theme through. And on the Monday morning, Candy Palmiter, who you might know as a broadcaster or TV actor, TV creator, but is also a Dow Law School grad um, and uh, went on to practice labor and Aboriginal law and then directed the First Nations Education uh, Department for the province of Nova Scotia and is currently an M.Ed. candidate at St. FX. Um, Candy's going to talk all about uh, change, change by the sea. Uh, Tuesday morning, we're going to have Peter Cornish and Tom Nault from Student Wellness and Counseling Center at MUN. Uh, and you might have heard him speak elsewhere about his steps care model of service for students on his campus, but he's going to be presenting alongside Tom Nault, their re campus registrar, to talk about mental health service delivery and changes uh, clinically and systemically uh, at MUN. And then finally, on our last morning altogether, we're going to hear from Sheila cote who is Laurentian's ADP academic and Indigenous programs, and she's also Anishinaabe from the Temeag Agome, Agoma Anishinaabe, uh, and she's going to focus on chatting about some of her focus in her current role, which is on bringing about systemic changes that impact Indigenous learners in post-secondary education. So that's some ways that you might see the sea change theme materialize through the course of our time together. Uh, and we're going to also talk a bit a little later on about uh, some of the formats that you will see change through the course of the conference. So I'm going to turn it over to the next presenter to talk about those different formats. So hi, it's Andrew. Andrew. Um, um, just wanted to talk really quickly about the different kinds of presentations. Um, um, I'm going to run through some of the information on the concurrent sessions. And James is going to talk a little bit about uh, the poster sessions. Uh, and then Jean's going to talk a bit about the big ideas in the living library. The main thing I wanted to talk about with the concurrent sessions is uh, I don't want to go into great detail of what they all are because you've already signed up for these sessions and you've already submitted your successful uh, presentation proposals with a particular session format in mind. So when you review all the different kinds uh, of sessions that um, are offered, um, so that would be including things such as arts-based sessions, campfire sessions, debate sessions, uh, each of those has a different description. And you should make sure that you check with your proposal. Make sure you revisit what you signed up for, both in terms of the format and in terms of the timelines make sure you put something together that adheres to what those 
uh, structures are supposed to be. Um, all this information is available on the website in terms of the descriptions of all these different sessions. So if you want to revisit to make sure that what you've put together aligns, that would be great. Most of these are formats that you are likely familiar with from previous conferences. So there's nothing too new here. They range in terms of time. They range in terms of structure. They range in terms of format. They range in terms of the responsibilities of the presenter. Sometimes the presenter is disseminating information. Sometimes on things like a panel, the presenter is actually facilitating others who are presenting. So just revisit the content and the stru sorry, revisit the structure. Make sure you've got it lined up. Now, some of the different formats that we've got might be a little new to you. So um, James is going to talk a little bit about poster sessions because that might be something that you are a little less familiar with in ter if you have signed up to present a poster. Um, so yeah, you got accepted to do a poster instead of a concurrent session, or you volunteered to do a poster. Um, and I, I, I was really glad to get a chance to speak to this one. Um, poster sessions are always one of my favorite part of uh, conference going. I find it's such a more personal way of learning about what people are doing. Um, and I also I have a soft spot for, I think sometimes the post, poster presenters feel like um, they, they don't get quite as much attention as the uh, concurrent session presenter, so I, I think it's nice to show them a little love. Um, I also have a soft spot. This takes me back to my own uh, younger days. I was an avid science fair goer, and I feel like the poster represents that. Um, it's time to challenge your grade 11 science fair nerd. And I picked grade 11 because I went to school in Quebec, and that's when I graduated. So that was my big culmination year. Um, as you're preparing your poster and you're thinking about what to put on and what to present, um, I think it's important to remember that they serve a double purpose. Um, on the one hand, your poster needs to in support you as you engage on small scale conversations. You're not presenting to a room full of people. You're not presenting to a plenary session. It's going to be one, two, or three people at a time who are listening to what you have to say. But they are there to listen to what you have to say. So don't feel like the poster has to say everything you'll be talking about. Um, in that case, you want that poster to be the support, to be your visual, uh, to show the graph, to be a place where some extra details can be listed. Um, but you're the star of the show, and it's important that you give yourself a chance to shine here. Um, at the same end, uh, from that perspective, as a support, it, your poster also serves as your advertising. Um, some folks are going to be walking by, and believe it or not, they might be more anxious or more shy than you are, and they might just walk by. So make sure your poster has something that can grab their attention, that makes them pause for a second long enough to make that eye contact that makes you go, ah, let me tell you about what I've been working on. Um, and then you can have that conversation. At the same time, and this is where I'm, I'm going to be piling some work onto you, um, there are times where your poster will still be up, but you won't be around. And so uh, in addition to being a support, your poster represents you when you're not around. Um, I believe overall the posters wind up being up for about a day and a half. Maybe Megan one or two can correct me if my timing's a little off on that. Um, Oh, Megan, two. Two whole days. There we go. Look at that in bold font. Um, so yeah, that poster is representing you for two whole days of conference time. Um, and so it, it needs to be able to stand up on its own as well. Um, so that's where you can certainly refer to additional materials with a website, with some references. Um, so you do want it to be able to speak for itself. Um, so you're asking it to do two things at once, um, but that's where, again, the creativity and the joy of the process uh, kind of comes in. If you have to make a choice one way or another, I would submit that an engaging and accessible poster that leaves people wanting to know more will be better than this complete treatise that's dense with text that we need our reading glasses and all of a sudden we feel old because you've made us do that and stepping up close to read it. Um, that, that, that engaging accessibility component is so important. Um, so uh, like I said, I definitely want to add that to another part to think about as you prepare your poster. Um, and I think that's a lot of what I have. Like I said, I've actually got a soft spot for posters. If anybody likes to follow up with me, has questions, uh, you're welcome to. Throughout this process, as we talk about preparing your content, we're also going to talk about the review process. Don't be afraid 
to review your process with other people. Um, you don't want to rehearse. You don't want to sound like you've been practicing the exact words for the past while. But having somebody to give you feedback on what they see and what they're asking questions about can really help you improve your product. Um, I'm going to hand things back to Jean now as she shares some of our other unique presentation opportunities. Thank you, James. I have my screen is stuck, unfortunately, so I might ask some folks to move the slides for me, but I do have it up in another place so I can see. Um, thanks, that looks great. So one of the sessions this year that we'll be running um, again are our big idea sessions. Uh, which are meant to share a story, an idea, a problem, or topic in an efficient and an effective manner. And the way that we are doing this, our big ideas are powered by Pachekacha. Uh, and one great example, if you're interested in checking it out, is Leslie D'Souza's on um, the ACPA website. So that should send us from a link. But if it's not, uh, that information, I'll grab it from the caucus website as well for you. So we can move on to the next slide. Uh, those URLs there will take you to the Pachakacha website so that you have a chance to go through and get some information on what these presentations should look like. Um, they are 20 slides at a time, and each slide is 20 seconds. And so you're going to be moving through these quite quickly, and you'll see some fabulous examples on their website as to how to create the slides and how to make them visually appealing. We're asking that folks make sure that their slides are formatted 16 by 9 and that they're in Microsoft PowerPoint only, please. This is important because everybody is going to be going one after another in their sessions. And so we're going to want to make sure that we can move through them uh, quickly in sequence. We'll also ask folks so that they practice their timing so that they can move through the slides in 20 seconds each. But you do not need to time your slides. In fact, please don't. Um, Alice and I are going to be going through in advance to make sure that they're all lined up and we can go one after another between the two presentations between the presentations so we can move on to the next slide these should have been timed sorry folks <laughs> um, so what else do you need to know about big ideas if you are a big ideas presenter please note that you need to submit your presentation no later than Friday Friday May the 25th to Allison at events at caucus.ca and again, we really do need those presentations in on that day so that we can time them and lay them out to be able to run through them all at the conference. Um, unlike the other presentations, you do not need to bring your own laptop. And you can expect in the session room to find a projector, a screen, sound, a podium with a microphone attached, uh, and a speaker's assistance to track time. So uh, I'll be there, Allison will be around, uh, and some other folks to support you when you get there. We can move on to the next. And where will you be getting to, you might ask? Well, these big idea sessions are going to be held on Monday, June the 18th, from 1.15 to 2.15, or Tuesday, June the 19th, from 10.45 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. So there are two different sections of Big Ideas presentations, and these are going to be happening concurrently with a concurrent session. So a little bit different from how other uh, how things have happened at other caucus conferences, at least. Um, they will not be held separately. You will be able to choose either to attend a Big Idea or um, another concurrent session. Uh, as a heads up to you as presenters, please note that you will be presenting these big ideas in the main plenary ballroom. So there's hopefully going to be lots of space there, uh, but we wanted to make sure that you knew in advance that that was going to be the venue. Thanks, folks. Uh, so as Jean said, thank you so much for folks who have volunteered um, to 
uh, submit proposals for big idea sessions, but especially to folks who have come forward to be part of our libra living library this year. So the purpose of the Living Library is to share stories and lived experience with conference attendees to help participants gain new appreciations for diverse ways of experiencing the world. Uh, we can go into the next slide. So we have a number of folks lined up to be participants in this Living Library, and they're going to be talking about all sorts of uh, experiences in their own lives. Um, there's We've been fortunate enough that a lot of folks from PEI and from the East Coast are going to share some stories about their ways of living that have been quite unique and different from what I'm sure folks from uh, Ontario and Central Canada and the West Coast or just living in big cities or having never, uh, never experienced some of the same issues that these folks have experienced. These, these things are going to be quite new. So we're looking forward to hearing from them. And if you have uh, signed up to be a Living Library participant, if you can please make sure to complete our biography form, which you'll see, you can click the link there, or you'll be able to click, as Megan said, uh, in the link in the recording of the webinar. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to discuss your Living Library human bookness with anyone, uh, please feel free to reach out to the person who's nominated you or to one of the program development committee members uh, to discuss what kind of theme or experience it is that you would like to share. And we ask that you consider what experiences you have had that would enhance the way the conference attendees do their work. Next slide, please. Uh, so as a heads up, you can expect to chat with participants for 20 to 25 minutes at a time. But if your conversation is flowing lovely, lovely, then you won't be forced to leave any conversations ever. So um, if you're chatting with someone for the duration, that's totally fine. We want to let you know that we are still recruiting human books for this living library. And so I'll invite you to get in touch with either myself or Jessica Pilfold, who is the chair of the Program Development Committee. Um, so please, please, please do reach out. If you are interested, I know that some folks on this call are already signed up. Thank you very much again for doing so. Or if you think that you might have somebody in mind that you think would really uh, add something to this format, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, we can chat about connecting with them. Thank you very much, folks. And um, so that you know, oh, no, it's OK. We can go back. Um, so that you know, that Living Library session will be June 19th, the Tuesday, from 2.45 to 3.45. And again, it's a long concurrent session. And once again, all of these things are taking place in the main plenary ballroom. So that is that. And I will turn things back over to James and Megan. All right. I'm thinking about being a living library because I want to put James Redden human book on my business card. Um, so <laughs> that's silliness aside. Let's let's talk and think about creating your successful presentation. Um, so question for the audience. Audience participation time. I'd invite you to share your answers in the webinar chat because um, what was inspiring for you may well be inspiring for somebody else. Um, so I'd like you to think about some of the best presentations you've ever attended at a conference. If this is your first ever conference, then I'd like you to think about what was a really great lecture you saw. When was the time that somebody shared their ideas, shared their passion, shared their research in a way that made you want to engage with them? What are your best experiences related to facilitation? So I'd like you to think about that for a minute and then please share with us, um, both for yourself but also to see what other people are thinking about uh, what they've seen and you may see something there that helps ignite your um, passion for that. I'm going to keep talking because it gets awkward if we just sit around silently while folks are typing. Um, but Megan is going to be monitoring your responses, and uh, we may even highlight a few or share a few things that seem really exciting. 
So some, some things that I'd like you to think about, and the first one is content. And as I was actually chatting with Megan about what I was going to say here, um, I acknowledged that there's a certain presumptuousness for me from my role in little old PI as a counselor at a small university to tell all of you how you're supposed to present or what your content is. Um, you are your content expert. Um, you had an idea for something that was worth sharing. You went through the work of putting in a proposal. I was on the proposal review committee. I know you guys were looked at hard, and we pick the best ones. You guys have already had your ideas validated, so you're allowed to be proud and confident of those. Um, so develop that, stick with that. A few themes I'd give, Andrew talked about knowing what style of presentation that you had done. You definitely want to try and be coherent and consistent with that. Think about the time you have. It is better to explore one idea well if you've got a short amount of time and really make people hungry for it and passionate about it than to try and say 12 things and muddle your message. Message. So as you tailor your content, fit it to what it is you're doing, the style of your presentation, and the time you have. You also want to think a little bit about, how is this new? Um, what am I doing here that's going to make people go, huh, that's kind of cool. I suspect that's why you wanted to do it. Um, you thought that there was something neat, something different about this. Share that newness. Let us know how it's, it's, how it's new, how it's different. It may look like something somebody has done before. Tell us about why it is a bit different. Um, Caucus has been working to develop uh, common language and to add depth to the way we do our work. And so we do, we pay attention to our theoretical foundations where caucus is kind of interesting is we're an association of very diverse professionals. Um, and this year, we're not only caucus, uh, Arook is joining us as well, another set of diverse professionals. And so you'll want to take time to, A, refer to your own theoretical foundations, who informs the work you do. Think about, again, your audience. If you're, you've promoted this as a good um, beginning student affairs professional, you may want to take time to explain your theoretical foundations a bit more. If you've identified it as a presentation for senior student affairs for professionals, for established professionals, you may simply refer to the foundations you have. Um, I'd also invite you to think of moving from not only the theoretical foundations of your particular field, but how they relate and how they connect to the broader area and, and the emerging field of student affairs and of student development theory. Um, so tying those two sets of theories together can get really productive and start to make people go, oh, that's a really cool way of connecting things. Um, which I guess takes us to our fourth point, the notion of the relevancy, the significance, making people go, this matters. Um, while it can sound harsh, I invite you as you review your work and as you invite other people to review your work to be constantly asking, so what? Why am I sharing this? Why does this matter? Both on the broad scale, although like I said, on the broad scale, we said this matters. But individually, as you think of each slide, as you think of each component, why does this matter? How does this add to my participants' experience of what I'm talking about? Um, I think is so important. Uh, so you'll want to be asking yourself that question on a regular basis. Make sure your presentation flows. Try to avoid jumping around from one subject to another. Lead us through how it goes. There's always that risk. We've, you've been living with this project, with this research um, for a long time. And so you know how it's organized. And it can be tempting to go, oh, I know that this is connected to this, so I should talk about it. But take your audience through that. Let them know what's going on on that flow of where they move. Um, and finally, if you can take some time to address how your presentation addresses the caucus competencies. I wasn't sure what I was going to say about that, so I had a conversation with Megan about it. And she made a good point that it's not about me enumerating the competencies here. You can look those up on the caucus website. But think of the competencies as 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 Cox's attempt to create a common language for the work we do. What are the things that we all have in common? And I think by looking those over, you can help create a presentation that's going to appeal and seem relevant to people from the various areas that come to us. So they won't have to share your specific field of interest or expertise. And I think if you can cover those points as you prepare your presentation, you're going to have a really rich and important presentation that's going to matter to people. And finally, as I said before, don't worry about rehearsing. You don't want to sound like you've practiced this 10,000 times and you knew which word is coming ahead of time. Flow, naturalness, I see people having comments about presenters tying their experiences, about humor, relevant stories um, are all examples that matter to them. So review, review, review. 
Um, share your work ahead of time. Have colleagues and peers look at what you say. They're going to catch the things that you assume that everyone knew about. Have your friends who aren't even involved in student affairs go through it with you so they can see what seems exciting and, and fascinating. Um, I know you can also get some feedback. Look at the reviewer comments you got. The folks who already reviewed this and said, yes, we want to hear about this, but we'd love to hear more of this, or you might want to say a little less of that. See what those people have to say. I know sometimes it's easy to fall into the, oh, they didn't like me for that, or they didn't like that, but it's actually those, that, that feedback is offered in the hope of making your presentation better, so definitely look at it as well. And finally, I know John is going to share this again, but I love saying important things twice. Um, you can also get feedback from the accessibility review team to make sure that the way you've structured your presentation is available and accessible to all. Um, so I'm going to hand things over now to Allison, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Knowing the Room. Hi, everyone. My name's Allison. I'm the conference manager for Caucus. Um, also helping support on the RUC side of things as well this year. And I just want to prepare everyone for a little bit more of the logistical side of things as you're working towards your trip to uh, Charlottetown in a few months. Um, so this year, all concurrent session meeting rooms will have a screen, sound, a podium with a microphone, and a slide advancer. Please note, you are expected to bring your own laptop this year, and if you use a Mac, you need to have the appropriate adapters. If you require any audiovisual over and above these items, it will be at the expense of the presenter, and you can, of course, connect with me directly to get some more clarification, or if you need to be connected to our audiovisual team. We strongly encourage presenters to use Microsoft PowerPoint, and John will speak to that in a little more detail following uh, my little presentation here today. Um, I'd also like to add uh, that we, we try to encourage presenters not to use Prezi, as the animations and the zoom in and out features can and have caused nausea for attendees, especially attendees seated in the front row, so please avoid that platform. Room assignments we're working on right now, and that will be formally announced later in April. When you check in at the conference, we encourage you to explore the convention center and visit your room in advance of your presentation to familiarize yourself with the space and the location of your presentation room in relation to the nearest washrooms, as well as the registration and accessibility info counters. There is no formal uh, registration for any of the concurrent sessions, so delegates will attend your session based on your program abstract and your competency descriptions in the program. You still have time to make edits. You can view the latest version of the program uh, in the shareable documents here in Adobe, or of course, if you check out the caucus website. If you have any changes, please send them to me. Uh, we will be working on the print program in May, so we do need all changes in writing by the end of the month. In terms of room setup, unless it's absolutely critical to the success of your presentation, all rooms will be arranged in rows of chairs, theater style, in an effort to allow maximum capacity in each room. This year, we're unable to accommodate every setup request due to the sheer number of attendees joining us this year. Uh, for the most part, room setup will remain the same from day to day. But in some cases, room setups will change. For example, if you check in on a Sunday and see your meeting room is set in rounds, this setup might change overnight for Monday's round of presentations. Of course, if you have any questions about the confirmed setup of your presentation room, you can connect with me directly. And at the conference, you can check the setup of your room with the volunteers at the registration counter. The capacity of each room varies from 25 people to even 200 people in the larger spaces. Due to the overwhelming response from presenters and delegates, we have had to expand our conference space beyond the convention center this year, so we've also moved some sessions to the Holman Grand Hotel. Select presentations also take place in the cold Gray Palmer Ballroom during the conference. We've notified the primary presenters of those presenting in the main ballroom as well as the Holman Grand Hotel. So if you have not yet received a notification, you are more than likely presenting in one of the convention center breakout rooms. And again, those rooms will be announced later this month. This year, we've also scheduled two featured programming streams in each of the 12 time slots. The first are sessions with content applicable towards the Indigenous cultural competency, and the second stream includes content applicable for senior student affairs officers. 
You can sort these sessions in their streams when the digital app is released uh, in early June. And of course, the detailed print program with the full program description for all sessions will be available at registration. Something um, Megan and I wanted to bring to your attention, the Convention Center this year has named all breakout rooms after the Fathers of Confederation. And we are working closely with the host committee team as well as local elders uh, to incorporate aspects of local Indigenous culture to encourage delegates and presenters to think about the spaces that we occupy at this conference this year and think a little bit beyond land acknowledgement that we will script out at the beginning of each presentation. So more to come on that front. I'd also like to touch quickly on our volunteers. They'll be in blue shirts this year. I think in past years we've identified volunteers in red, so we're changing it to blue. They're a wonderful resource on site at the conference this year. They have information about the conference schedule. They can attend to those with accessibility requests. They'll help correct issues with your name badges. They have handy tips and local insider information about what to do in Charlottetown, what to do on the island during your day, and they're very, very helpful and will be floating all over the convention center and the Holman Grand. We're also thrilled to receive support from community of practice leads to support in the speaking ambassador role this year. Professionally, community of practice leads have a shared interest in your program content, and their role is to help greet attendees, they're going to introduce you, thank you at the conclusion of your session. They'll take a head count to track attendance numbers and keep track of the clock. Many of these volunteers are going to be staff members from our host institution, University of Prince Edward Island, as well as Holland College. And they're generously donating many hours of their week to ensure the conference runs smoothly. So I would ask all presenters to also thank the volunteer assisting in your session as well. We also have members of the audio-visual team Freeman available to help you on the technical side of things, so there won't be any shortage of hands to support you during your presenter experience at the conference this year. Uh, due to very limited space, as we all know, uh, we don't have capacity to run a speaker-ready room this year, so we encourage you to find a quiet space with your co-presenters to review your conference content if you need. Um, our program review committee is also working on concurrent session evaluations. We want to give you lots of feedback after the conference is over, and we'll be in touch with those details later in May. And finally, the big one, as I'm sure you all know, registration is sold out. Uh, as we require all presenters to register for the conference, we've held a very small number of spots for presenters who have yet to register. Please email me after this webinar if you have not registered, and I will call you to grab credit card information and everything we need to get you set up. Uh, please note we cannot accept any new co-presenters on the schedule due to very limited space. Um, so of course you know where to reach me, and now I would like to introduce a member of the Accessibility Subcommittee, John, to walk us through minimum accessibility expectations at the conference this year. Thank you, Allison. I want you to take a good look at this slide. Consider the font size, the use of color, and the slide background. This is an example of a slide that we do not want you to create as a caucus presenter. Next slide. Hi, my name is John Chagall, and I'll be showing you the basics of creating a presentation that is accessible to all caucus participants. Next slide. So what is an accessible presentation? Well, it incorporates formatting techniques that enable people with disabilities to more easily access the presentation content. As Canada's premier higher education association, we must lead the way. And so we expect you, the 2018 conference presenter, to implement these formatting techniques in your presentation. Next slide. OK, in terms of slide accessibility, here's what you need to do. Use 40 plus font size for the slide title. Use 30 font size for headings and body text. Use Calibrary, Arial, or Open Dyslexic font types. Use black and white or high contrast colors. Only three to seven bullet points of body text per slide. Next slide. 
To make a slide accessible, all images need to be accompanied by alt text. Alt text describes an image with text so that a user's assistive technology can convey the information. It is used to explain pictures, images, graphs, graphics, tables, and flowcharts. Alt text appears when the cursor moves over a picture or object. All videos require captioning or transcripts. Ensure a high contrast between slide foreground and background. Establish a reading order. If someone can access the information on the slide, the reading order tool allows for the viewer to receive the information in the order the author intended. Use access the accessibility checker to check and fix content issues that people with disabilities might find difficult to read. Next slide. Is your presentation easy to see, understand, and hear? These tips will help ensure that it is. Use of the room mic is essential. If CART, Communication Access Real-Time Translation Services, are needed, a wearable mic has to be used in tandem with the room mic. Use simple and clear language. Presenters must make five large print copies of 30 point available. Also very important is that presenters must bring and use their own laptop. I think we should email Andrea and uh, Next slide. Social media do, your, do you want your presentation to be reviewed? If you'd like to have a member of our accessibility committee review your presentation, please make it available by May 25, 2018 by putting it in the caucus drop box. Over to you, Andrew. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some tips in terms of uh, the presentation itself, uh, how things go on the day and how you present your information. Um, a couple of things to mention off the top. Uh, if you've got questions on any of this uh, content, please feel free to put it into the chat. We're going to end off our session today with a Q&A and we'll do our very best to get to all your questions. Um, I also want to point out that, that uh, information on how to make an accessible presentation and the different concurrent session types are available to you right now in the shared files window that you'll see on your screen. Those are documents that you can download that can uh, help you with some of the content that we've been talking about during the session. And I also want to encourage you to take a look at the chat if you haven't already. Um, there were some great uh, ideas and bits of feedback that came in from the group in terms of what your favorite or best presentations were. So there's some great stuff in there. In terms of how to actually deliver a successful presentation, a few things to think about. The first is it's really important to know your audience. Try and get a sense right off the top of who's in the room. We did a, a poll at the beginning of this presentation to get a sense of how many of you have experience presenting at the conference before. That allows us to gauge the way we present the material. If everybody had said that they were experienced presenters, we probably wouldn't go into quite as much detail, folks more in Q&A. If everybody had said that they um, had never presented before, that would have also adjusted the way we presented the information in the presentation. So don't just assume. Know your audience. Ask a question off the top to get a sense of their experience with the content, their experience with conferences, um, so that you can tailor things in the best possible way. Um, it's important to manage expectations. I think you should consider starting your presentations with a very brief, this is who I am, this is who I'm going to talk about, this is what I expect you're going to learn from today's session, and here's how long I'm going to take and where you can take, where I'm going to be taking questions. I think taking a couple of minutes off the top to establish some ground rules, uh, establish what the learning outcomes are going to be, helps people understand what they can expect from the session, and make sure that they're in the best frame of mind to get the information that you're going to present. I think it's also an idea to contemplate um, how do you bring your audience together? There's a few different ways that you can do that. Let me give you an example of one of the most difficult presentations I've ever had to do that challenged me the most in my presenting skills. Now, I'm not actually going to tell you what that is. The reason I said that is because one of the ways you can bring your audience together is starting off with a personal experience. When I said that, I'm quite sure, I hope, people focused in, everybody got to the same place, and was waiting to hear what I'm going to say next. 
So starting off in a way that, that is personal with a story is a great way to bring the group together. Another great way to bring the group together is to start off with something unexpected. If you play a video or do something or use media in a way that people are not expecting right off the top, it brings the whole group together. Humor also works in the same way, that it establishes a tone right off the top that, is very, that can be very beneficial, that can get people interacting more later on in the presentation. It's really hard to expect your audience to start participating halfway through the presentation. If you want interactivity, if you want your audience to play a role, get them to start doing it right off the top. Another way you can bring your audience together, uh, and certainly to incentivize part uh, participation, is to have giveaways, is to have things that you use to incentivize your audience to ask questions. If you can score some swag from your institution, um, so I've seen people use chocolates or candies to great effect, basically ask a question, get a chocolate. Those kinds of things will bring out your audience and get them engaging. Uh, and if you do it off the top, again, if you announce this is what I'm going to be doing, it's, again, a great way to bring the audience together. So, so think about starting with everybody in the same place. Don't just assume they got there. You bring them together to the same place. Um, in terms of verbals and nonverbals, a couple of things to think about. This is a really painful suggestion, but it's something to consider. Consider videotaping yourself or recording yourself for about five minutes of public speaking before you do your presentation. And look specifically at verbals, such as pauses, ums, and ahs, to get a sense of how much you're doing that. We are all very surprised when we see the playback of how much we rely on things like uh, um, and those kinds of things. Uh, Think about it, and the best way to really understand the extent to which you do it is to look at yourself recorded. Also pay attention to the nonverbals. Um, I've been in presentations where the presenter was moving around the room because I know they were thinking that they were trying to be dynamic, but it was actually very hard to follow. It, it, I felt like I was chasing the presenter around the room. And I think it was a very deliberate thing they did to not be static, to not just stand behind the podium. But can, it can actually be distracting. I've also seen presenters who do things that I'm, I'm not sure if they, I don't think they know they're doing it, but it's probably the result of being a little nervous, like rocking back and forth, pacing back and forth. Again, just take five minutes of yourself uh, recorded, take a look, and that might give you a few pointers. Don't look at, don't look at the, the recording from the point of view of the content. Look at the recording from the point of view of how you present. When you're putting together your slides, I want to encourage you to, to think of your slides um, not as speaking notes. I've seen a lot of presentations where people have put a lot of information on each slide to the point that really I think the slide is more for them as a presenter to keep them on track than it is for their audience. I'm sure we've all seen these. This is where you get 12 bullet points with 12 point font. The language on the slide is in fully constructed sentences. There's no paraphrasing. There's no attempt to be brief. In these cases, this can actually serve to distract because now your audience is spending a lot of time reading or they're tuning out because there are too many words on the screen. I would encourage you to think of your slides in three different ways. One, your slides should be presenting information that you can't present verbally. So if it's an image, if it's something meant to be evocative, if it's something that you can't use words for, that's a good thing to put on a slide. Secondly, a slide is also very useful if you're putting up technical information, if it's detailed, if it's data, if there are numbers, if there are things that are hard to understand, if a diagram is required to create better understanding, more so than what words could do, that's a great piece of content to put on a slide. And lastly, think of your slides as guides. As, as much as we'd like to think that we're the most compelling presenter in the world, odds are at some point during your presentation, members of your audience are going to tune out. Having a slide there that gives the audience a sense of where we are in the presentation, what we're talking about, not the content of what we're talking about necessarily, but the subject heading or where we are in the presentation can be useful for keeping people tied in if they decide to tune out for, for a minute or two. 
Think about mixing your media. Uh, it's always nice to have uh, different types of content, images, videos, audio, not for the purpose, uh, uh, I don't want you to put those in artificially, but just mixing it up can be a great way to hold your audience's attention. In terms of questions, this is something that every presenter is going to have to think about. How do they want to manage questions? Do you want to take questions as you go? Do you want to leave them to the end? Personally, I always prefer to take a few questions as we go so that people don't forget their questions or that it establishes a tone that I'm being responsive and that I want to provide you with the information that you as an audience member want. But you've got to be careful because sometimes, it, particularly if you're dealing with something controversial or complex, it'll, the questions will start coming fast and furious and you'll go down the rabbit hole. And a handful of people in the audience who have a lot of questions will stay focused and you'll lose everybody else. So there's a balance. Take a couple of questions, and then if it keeps going, maybe say you're going to move on and deal with them at the end so that you don't lose your audience members. Lastly, if you take a question from the audience, particularly if it's in a large room, please remember to repeat the question. Odds are you're using a microphone, but your audience member is not. So you will have heard the question, but the majority of the room will not. So just take a second to repeat the audience member's question before you answer it into the microphone. Um, lastly, really simple thing. If you're nervous and worried about presenting, and maybe you haven't presented as much, one of the best tricks you can do to help you deal with that is very simple. Have a glass of water there. One of the hardest things to do when you're presenting is if you, if you get lost, if you get flustered, if you get off track, how, just taking the time that's required to pause, think, and get yourself back where you want to go. It is very hard to do that standing quietly in front of an audience. It's a lot easier if you've got a glass of water, take a sip, take a long sip, make that sip last. You're really not that thirsty. You're just using that time to think about where you're at and where you want to go next. So give yourself those kinds of uh, tools to, if you do get in a place where you, you get a little lost, um, that's a great trick to just take a pause and get yourself back on track. Uh, I'm just mindful of time, so I'm going to encourage questions if they come in to come in via the chat, and we'll deal with them at the end in a Q&A, but I'm going to turn things back to Allison to talk a little bit about the nitty-gritty of preparing for your presentation. Um, I think just for the purpose of time, um, this is much of the similar information I, I delivered it earlier, so we can just kind of um, move along there and uh, ask away. I'm seeing a lot of dialogue in the chat box. If anyone uh, would like to ask any questions, by all means. We have just under two minutes left before we'll stop the recording and move along with the afternoon. I think that's a so question I, maybe directed at you from Juliana there. Uh. So Juliana, um, we did offer that opportunity upon the uh, submission process. Um, to specify the room setup you like, but feel free to touch base with me after uh, the meeting today and, and we can configure your room setup. Um, as I mentioned in, uh, in an earlier uh, comment, we, we can't add additional co-presenters. I'm not sure if that was the question. Is it too late to get another co-facilitator who is all ready to join us? Um, so unless the, the presenter was added uh, in February or March, we can't register additional people just because I'm going to start putting sessions on the roof. Carla Territory Acknowledgement, our volunteer uh, volunteers are working on that and we'll have a special script. Um, we'll, we'll prepare you for that in, in the next uh, six weeks. Uh, 
house and it looks like that extra presenter is already registered. Should she connect with you about that? Yeah, if someone's already confirmed to attend the conference, it's not too late to make adjustments to your uh, presentation. Again, the latest version is all concurrent sessions underscore April 6th. That's the version that's on all the websites uh, right now. We can still make, uh, I can remove sessions, um, add uh, existing registrants and, and change and tweak your program descriptions accordingly. That's right, Sherman. You don't have to send it. The accessibility review is a voluntary thing under the discretion of the presenter. That's right. We don't have to submit presentations for review this year. If you'd like them reviewed, we'd appreciate them by May 25th. And Linda is asking about a waiting list for those who haven't been able to register. And Allison, I've heard you say this before, but correct me if I'm wrong, unfortunately, due to the space restrictions, we won't be even able to set up a waiting list this year, will we, for registration? That's correct. Um, unfortunately, we can't accommodate due to the high, high demand and volume this year. A good problem to have, but we've had to deal with a lot of disappointed people in the last two weeks. Carrier Caucus won't be taking place there, Eric, so we won't be able to do your rooftop U2 video, but there is a neat bar with a rooftop patio that can be on the <laughs> You can find me and I'll show you. And I, I, I think that similar to the U2 video, if the cops show up at your session, it's probably not a good thing. <laughs> well, good point, Megan. Okay, strike the roof. The snow will all be gone by June. I, I can almost promise that. And Rachel, you've got a good point, but the Beatles did break up right after they did it, so it wasn't a happy ending. <laughs> All right, folks, it's 3 o'clock. We started on time. We should probably try and wrap up since we're moving on to Beatles trivia. Um, <laughs> and maybe, Allison, would you like the last word? Ooh, the last word. What do I say? What do I say? Um, again, you know my contact info, events at caucus.ca for all of your conference needs. Room assignments released later this month. I'll share the recording of this webinar with everyone. Um, again, if you need any reviews uh, or tips or tricks, send us your presentation uh, by Friday, May 25th, just to give our volunteer team ample time to review your session. We'll also be sending out the link for the uh, digital app for 2018. You can upload bios, headshots, and uh, all that information yourself, and then test out the app before we share it with the delegation later in June. So we have lots of exciting stuff coming your way. Thank you so much again for supporting our conference. Overwhelming support this year, and uh, we're so grateful. Thank you. Hey, we got one last question. Uh, can we take one last question from Nicole about the accessibility standards for Pecha Kucha? Sure. I'm going to have to get back to Nicole, Ms. Jean. But probably some extra large copies are would be useful. All right. All right. So yeah, last question to end it on. Follow us on Twitter at Caucus Tweets, and we're establishing it now, the hashtag for the conference, because we've got a Rook and Caucus coming together. Let's get using hashtag SeaChange18. Sounds great, and thanks, everybody, for taking the time today, and we uh, look forward to seeing you 